The original five towns, as they're known of Prague, are Malastrana, which was the first to be settled, Hradchani, up on the hill with the castle, which was second, Old Town, the Jewish Quarter, and Nova Miesto, or New Town. As we all know, New Town was designed by King of Bohemia and Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV, and he had moved the seat of the Holy Roman Empire here to Prague. What is not known by a lot of people is that he had very specific plans when he designed the New Town. He wanted it to be a New Jerusalem so that when Jesus returned to judge the quick and the dead, he would feel right at home. To talk with me today about that is local fixture and journalist Raymond Johnston. Hi, Raymond. Hi, how are you doing? Excellent. So we're going to talk today about Prague as the new Jerusalem and a fitting home for the returned and triumphant Christ. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location It's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. So I think you first told me about this, Raymond, when we all ended up at the New Town Hall at the base of Carlo van Amisti, Charles Square, where they were doing the reenactment celebrating the 600th anniversary of the first defenestration. And then we were walking around up Carlo van Amisti, and you started to talk about this. I was, I, I've never heard it. It was absolutely fascinating. So really, Prague as Jerusalem? Yes. Um, Jerusalem in in the Middle East during the Crusades fell out of the Christian control. So many of the leaders in Europe were thinking, well, obviously when the apocalypse comes, God is not going to come to a non-Christian world because God is obviously Christian. So he's got to come someplace else. And there's actually a little bit of a competition to be the new Jerusalem, but I think Charles IV made the best effort. So Newtown, he planned it in 1348 or so, and he made the outline based on a crude map of the actual Jerusalem. He had some kind of would-be atlas or something. It's not a very close match, but you can kind of see where he was trying. And he actually thought Karlovo Namiesti would be the town center and not Wenceslas Square. Huh. And so on his map, Karlovo Namiesti correlates, and that's not what it was called then, correlates to where the Wailing Wall would be in Jerusalem, where the oh, temple was. Oh, and where the temple was, yeah. yeah. And actually there was a church in the square that's no longer there where they used to display the most holy relics, and that's gone. Uh, it would have been right where the tram tracks now go. Or oh, where the, the road that bisects, because yeah. that's... Yeah. It wasn't there before, right? No, no. That was all one big right. square. Because it was the cattle market, is that right? That was the cattle market. Then Wenceslas Square was the horse market. And right. then Sonobajne Namisti was the hay market where they would weigh things. That was the hay market. I always wondered. Oh, ah, yeah. interesting. When did it get bisected? It was bisected by the 1800s. There was like a road. Really? So that that far back? Huh. Yeah. Okay. Right around there where the tree is, because, you know, there's a a very famous tree right near the middle of the square that has been struck by lightning seven times, and yet it still lives. So right around there is where the Wailing Wall is in his scale model. Right, right. and uh, at the church he built there, uh, he was a big collector of relics, and his idea was if he had the most relics of anybody and the best relics, of course, God would come here. People would, you know, the saints would come back to find their missing fingers or their missing toes or, you know. Hey, that's my nose. That's my skull. <laughs> Put it back here. Well, oh, while we're here, this place is great. Let's stay. And, and it's so cheap and the beer. Right, <laughs> the, beer is, the beer is so good and so cheap. And I saw some of these years ago when they displayed them, when they restored the Master Theodoric paintings. They had some, some of his, his relics and others I've read about, but I have seen... He has thorns from the crown of thorns. He has one of the nails from the true cross, piece of wood from the true cross, 
Uh, I didn't see it, but supposedly he has Christ's robe or a piece of cloth from Christ's robe. I did see they have a uh, piece of the whip that flogged him. Good gosh. A piece of the sponge that the bitter gall was on when they tried to revive him. Hay from the manger. I love the idea that someone hung on to that. Well, yeah, that's... <laughs> All those years, 33 years. Yeah. That one kind of is the most suspicious because how would you know he was going to be famous later? Right. right? Well, but, uh, there was a star hanging over him. Yeah. Plus, <clears throat> mom was a virgin, so that's a little unusual. Usual. But I mean, all these things had have little certificates of authenticity from that time. Someone said these were the real things. You can believe or not. I'm, I would assume that was somebody in the Vatican. Yeah, there's a big holy relics market trade, right. and they could only be bought through certain official channels and stuff. The uh, Spear of Destiny used to be here in Prague for a while. It's in Vienna now. Uh, that's what I heard. And you know, Hitler was looking for that. For those that don't know, the Spear of Destiny is the spear that supposedly pierced Christ's side while he was on the cross and it somehow became imbued with his force or strength or holiness. The idea was that if an army had that before it, they would be invincible. And so Adolf Hitler was actually looking. Some people say this legend might be the basis for the 1981 movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, but instead of the spear, they made it the Ark because it's cooler looking. So where was it here? Was it part of Charles's collection? Yeah, it was part of his collection. He also, uh, in Vesherod still, you can see the uh, stone tomb of the guy that held the spear, but the bones were lost during the Hussite Wars, apparently. The bones and the lid were lost during the Hussite Wars, but huh. his tomb is still up in uh, Bisharad. And then, do we know how it got to Vienna, or no? I think under Rudolf, this was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, yeah. and eventually it just was moved to Vienna with some other stuff. I know we have a copy here that was displayed a few years ago, but it's only a copy. For a country that is so avowedly at least agnostic, if not outright atheist, that in our past, the greatest check, because, you know, the, who was it? Was it Radio Prague or, or Dines or somebody had a contest a few years ago asking the public who's the greatest check? And the winner was a fictional character named Yara Zimmerman, and Charles IV got second place, and then they decided it had to be a real person, and so Charles got first place. So it's interesting that the greatest check of all was so religious. Yeah. Also, uh, they believed in like horoscopes and astrology very heavily because uh, the Newtown Street plans, many of the streets will line up with the uh, solstice or the equinox or something, and you wonder why if they're planning. Really? Yeah, you wonder why if they're planning a neighborhood, why not just make a simple grid? It'd be so much easier to walk around. It, it's because Newtown is basically one giant Stonehenge. The uh, summer solstice, the uh, if you're at the old town tower on Charles Bridge, and you look to the castle, the sun sets right over where the old church used to be. It's now the altar of St. Vitus Cathedral. Peter Parler, the architect, designed both the bridge and the St. Vitus Cathedral. And the bridge was actually moved down river a bit from where the original Judith Bridge was. Right, yeah, it was just a, it was a, a what, yeah. 30, 40 meters. Because the uh, Malastrana side, the tower sets you out going in one direction, and then the bridge sort of veers off a bit. And the reason it does that is so they could get this alignment mm -hmm. on the uh, solstice. And it used to be that uh, because the calendar has changed over time due to leap year, St. Vitus feast day used to be much closer to the solstice. Now it's like a week before, I think. Right. But it would be St. Vitus day. There's a picture of St. Vitus on the Old Town Tower in a circle representing the sun. And then the sun sets on St. Vitus Cathedral. So you get this St. Vitus triple play. It's a hat trick. Yeah. And I've not checked this, but people say four of the churches that were built during Charles IV's time, if you look at a map and connect them, you get a cross. So he planned this like large cross to like extra bless the city that it's like a cross that, that can be seen from. from. From heaven. But some people take that like really far and they try to make connections between every church and you can, can see these maps full of all kinds of things. I think, you know, some of those things work and then sometimes you're just taking it a little too too far looking for connections where there aren't some. It's like Rorschach test meets connect yeah. the dots. Because honestly, I mean, you could, if you wanted to, you could come up with, I don't know, the outline of Pikachu from Pokemon, I suppose, if you, if you really wanted yeah. to. I think some of the things work. I think the uh, thought that he wanted the apocalypse to the uh, judgment day to happen in Carlo von Amnesty. I, I think that works if you look at how he planned the city and, and, and how, how he put the relics all there in the one chapel that's no longer there to make a focal point for God to come like, oh yeah, there's, there's all my stuff from the crucifixion, there's all these other relics. Right. That's
If you've gone to Karl von Amisti, you'll notice the tram stop there is called Moran. That's a remembrance of that area was a pagan uh, shrine, a pagan uh, grove for the uh, winter goddess. Ah, is this Celt? No, this was Slavic. So she's called Mor- Morana, or she's got similar names in Poland. It was a slightly different spelling. But she's the uh, winter goddess, uh, death and cold and freezing. Every year, there's the uh, they will take the spirit, the a effigy or something of Morana, and either burn it or throw it in the water to get rid of the deadly effects of the winter and allow the spring to come. Uh-huh. And, and that's actually that's like earlier than the uh, witch burning everyone knows about. And people can, tend to mix the two up. But this one's earlier. And there's a f- little bit of that grove is left. You can see there's some trees going down. It used to go down to the river. Mm-hmm. So you can see there's some pockets of so trees. So like down left. towards like Palace Cajon and all that. Right. Yeah. The church Imausi was one of the first churches built here, and that was part of the Christian effort to take over any pagan areas sure. and Christianize them. So that's the reason that was located there was to say, well, no, it's not your pagan uh, grove anymore. It's our Christian church. You can actually go through a like list of the pagan gods and uh, how they were converted into uh, uh, something similar, but with a different name or something. Say, so, oh yeah, harvest god, we've got that. Only it's not a harvest god, it's this guy. You know, it's pretty unusual, I think, to have a ruler say, hey, let's just build a whole new city. Because it, was, it wasn't part of the city. It was actually a separate city back in the day. And until Prague was united, really, in uh, the 1920s, each section was a separate municipality. And I heard a very funny story just off Napchikopia, which is the old moat between Old Town and New Town. Uh, there's this street, Nekazanka. There's... Two tales to it. And mm. one is that when they were building the streets, they uh, got a little enthusiastic and they built this street that wasn't planned, it wasn't called for, and that the name Nekazanka somehow relates linguistically to old language saying, you know, the, the unasked for street. I'm not paying for that street. Someone else is paying for that street. I didn't ask for it. <laughs> That's coming out of your wages, yeah. buddy. The second one, this this apparently was a bit of a dodgy area. Mm. It was forbidden for members of the uh, church to go down this street because it was somewhat of a dodgy area, possibly uh, bordellos and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 sure. That it was sort of the Red Lamp District. And so they said, no priests. Apparently, or just no priests wearing your priest outfits. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Charles IV wanted Karlov and Amnesty to be the main square, but it actually sort of ended up becoming Wenceslas Square. Which one's bigger? Karlov and Amnesty is technically bigger. I think it's, if not the biggest square in Europe, it's certainly the biggest square in Central Europe. So more, more cows than horses, I guess. It, it's hard to picture like a cattle market in the middle of downtown these days. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, true. you can sort of see a horse market, that makes sense, but a cattle market, I mean, you're like in the middle of the city. Where did people keep cows at home? I don't know, I suppose. <laughs> Traffic is snarled up today because today's the cattle drive, right? It's funny, neither one of those really are what many people who don't live in Europe would consider a square. First off, they're rectangles, if we're going to be pedantic. But of course, Karlova and Amnesty today is a park in two sections. And Wenceslas Square really just looks like a street. Now, Amnesty translates as square, but we think of, of, of square as more of like an actual square. And here it's more... Like open area, but still urban. And let me ask you this. This is always a debate. People say the top of the square or the bottom of the square. I always figured the top of the square, because it is slightly inclined, is up by the museum. The top is by the museum. And right. if you're going to give people directions, the top is by the museum because it's a bit of a hill. Up there, of course, is the statue of St. Wenceslas mm-hmm. on the horse, which is a very common meeting place here in Prague. Praguers will often say, okay, I'll meet you at the horse. And not just I'll meet you at the horse, but I'll meet you under the tail. If you ask old Czech couples where they first met for their first date, they'd say, oh, under the tail. The thing is, the uh, sculptor, uh, Misselbeck, he added a lot of things to, to that statue to make it look very Slavic, but they're not really historically accurate because mm. the uh, tail has it's tied up in this funny braided way, which makes it look much nicer like, like in the sculpture because you don't have, have these straggly hairs. But there's n- no historical evidence for the uh, tail to be tied up the way it is. Mm. But it looks really neat. It uh, does look neat. Yes, it does. If you look at the, the earlier uh, models he made, it, the, the statue looks a bit different. And uh, when, uh, Wenceslas was wearing more of a s- soft 
fur pointed hat and but then right around that time they, there was an archaeological find and they found this helmet and some other things they said oh this must be Wenceslas's helmet because who else in a thousand years might have lost a helmet where they were digging it has to be his has to be his <laughs> <laughs> has to be his. So immediately they changed the uh, statue design to incorporate this helmet that they found to make it look like that. So now when they display the uh, crown jewels every couple of years and they display the Wenceslas helmet, you're like, wow, that's exactly like the one on the statue. That that must be the helmet. How but funny. How funny. <laughs> Some guy, Bob. That's Bob's helmet. He's always losing stuff. So Prague is many things to many people, and this has been true throughout the centuries. One man's pagan grove is another man's tram stop. A park is a cattle market, but it's also the center of Jerusalem. And artists can do whatever they want with helmets. Well, thank you for talking to me today, Raymond. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. And thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of Prague Times. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prog Times. <laughs>